develop the ability to act, take action. Not hasty if it isn't required, but don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong. That's the time to act. See, Mr. Ron, I'd like to have a library like yours. See, if you feel strong about that, what you got to do is get the first book and then get the second book. Before the feeling passes and before the idea gets dim, action pronto, action immediate, action as soon as possible. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us. We intend to when the emotion is high. But now if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now, it's cold. A year from now, can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. Somebody talks about good health and you're stirred. Says, right, I need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before, before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the process, fall on the floor, do some push-ups. Action, gotta take action. Otherwise, the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise, the emotion soon passes. Unless you put it into a disciplined activity, capture it. Disciplines is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Disciplines. Now here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. Don't be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter. I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Okay. We all pity the man who says, well, this is the only place I let down. Not true. Key to take home. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. If you don't take the walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't consist, you know, start building your library. If you don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal and you won't take pictures and then you won't do this, you won't do wise things with your money, won't do wise things with your time, won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated and we say you have messed up. So the whole key to reversing that process now is to start picking up these disciplines. Now here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your disciplines. Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it. Because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block, it'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple, it'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book, it'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal, it'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new. And you've started a whole new life process. Key. Also, one more thought on discipline. Here's the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth. Self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. The least lack of discipline, and it starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit, right? The, the, the slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the cycle. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough. You say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now you've begun in the slightest way to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. 
Neglect starts as an infection. And if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy, like I should, and I could, and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now, giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. That's the key to discipline. Okay? Let's get kids involved in the least of disciplines. One more, and then one more, and then another one, and then another one, and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith and more courage. Now you've got something, a vessel in which to put it. And now the equities start to flow. And the early return, I'm telling you, if you'll start this process, the early return will have you so excited. You'll commit yourself to this strategy for the rest of your life. You'll never go back to the old ways. Join a new crowd, join a new group. The disciplines to do, take action. I recommended the last time I was here, the little book, Richest Man in Babylon, and I said, I've lectured now to over three million people in the last 33 years, and I've recommended this little book to almost all of them, I think. Guess how many have actually gone and got this little book? Answer, very few. My best guess is 10%. Such an easy thing to do. In that last seminar, right, I suggested this little book, number one, is easy to find. Number two, it's easy to buy. The most you can pay for it, six, seven, eight dollars. You can borrow that from your kids. And number three, it's easy to read. It's in story form. That's why I use it for teenagers, teaching them how to be rich by 40, 35, if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. But if it's easy to find and easy to buy, and if it's easy to read, why wouldn't everybody go get it? We don't know. What do you know? You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> here's how profound it is. Some do and some don't. Now here's the numbers. About 10% do. 90% don't or won't. And we don't know the mystery of that. And I'm telling you, 10 years from now, those numbers will still be the same. 10% will, 90% won't. The numbers don't change, only the faces change. You're looking at one of the faces. I used to belong to the 90% who couldn't be bothered even if it was easy. Guess how many people have a library card? Wisdom of the world available. Transform your life in any value amount you want. By the way, how much is a library card in Texas? Free, here's what free is, easy. I mean, it can't be any easier than free. Somebody says, well, would you bring it by? Well, no, at least you gotta go get it. No. Wisdom of the world available. Transform your life spiritually, socially, personally, economically, and every other way. Teach you how to be rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many people have a library card? Answer, 3%. 95, 97% couldn't be bothered. Guy specializes in happy hour, but he doesn't have a card. <laughs> and now readily and quickly blames the government and blames his company and blames policy and blames the pay scale. When if he only knew, if he joined the 3%, here's my advice to you today, walk away from the 97%. Don't talk like they talk, don't act like they act, don't go where they go, don't specialize in what they specialize in. Throw away the blame list they cling to. Start you a new life. You say, well, is it as simple as getting a library card and join the 3%? And the answer is, of course, of course. That's how easy this stuff is. This is so easy, it's so simple, it's not complex. You don't need a 2,000 year old guru. You don't need multi-track affirmations. I'm telling you, you don't. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion.
Don't let somebody sweep you into some contrary way to nature itself, says, unless you labor the miracle of the seed and the soil and the seasons and God and all the other stuff that's available, sunshine and rain, that's not available to you by affirmation. It is only available to you by labor. So labor well. Okay. Learn well. Discipline yourself well. And you can have all the treasures you want. This stuff's easy and simple. It's not ocean waves and seagulls. You don't have to move to Sedona, where all the force fields come together in Arizona. <laughs> Let's teach our kids the simple ways to transform their health, number one. Their economics, number two. Their ability to communicate, number three. Their life and treasure and lifestyle, number four. Spirituality, number five. And the list goes on and on. Let's not leave out any of the least of disciplines that encourage us to do the next one, to do the next one, to do the next one. First thing you know, this whole scenario for you is spinning up instead of out of control on the negative side. This is all you got to do. It's as simple as this. It's as simple as a start, committing yourself to life change. And once you start down this road, I promise you, you'll join the 10% and the 3%. We're going to talk financial independence in just a little while. Guess how many people can retire from the income of their own personal resources when it comes time to retire? Answer, 5%. In the most independent country in the world, 95% are dependent, 5% are independent. Take charge of your own retirement. I'm telling you, if you take charge of your own retirement through personal development and all these skills we've taught today, plus what's coming up, financial independence, I'm telling you, take charge of your own retirement, you can multiply it at least by five, maybe by 10, maybe by 20, maybe by 100. Let the government take care of it, some company take care of it, you got to divide by five. <laughs> take charge of your own life, take charge of your own day, take charge of your own conversation, take charge of your own family, take charge of your own possibilities and learn these skills, develop this kind of strategy, and I'm telling you, life will open up for you. Join the 3%, join the 10%, join the 5%, walk away from the 95%. In our Leadership Weekend, we teach, find out what poor people read and don't read it. Don't talk like they talk. Lend a helping hand, but don't fall into the their poor philosophical scenario. Don't blame what they blame. Don't use the excuses they use. It's called the language of the poor. Switch gears, switch language, switch ideas, switch strategy. Start with the simplest of disciplines. And don't be mean any of these disciplines. The smallest of disciplines starts the process of life change. And if you'll invest in this thing called discipline, you can have whatever you wish. It's called the beginning of a miracle. Now here's the last clue on discipline. Do the best you can. We covered earlier, but here's a good scenario for the do the best you can. I've got a good question for you. Is the best you can do all you can do? And the answer is no. Strangely enough, if we all fell on the floor right now and did as many push-ups as we possibly could, and let's say for some reason you haven't been into push-ups lately, I can't imagine why, but let's say, and let's say the best you can do is five. And you look up at the rest of us and say, hey, five is the best I can do. We can tell by the look on your face, that's probably true. Five is the best you can do. Now is five all you can do? The answer is no. If you rest a little, you can do five more. Wow. And if you rest a little, you can do five more. And if you rest a little, you can do 15 more. How did we get from five to 15? It's a miracle. <laughs> and if you rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 15. Rest a little, you can do 20. How did you get from five to 20? It's a miracle. Did you know you can keep doing that? Do a little more, rest a little, do a little more, rest a little, and finally get up to 50 push-ups? Is it possible to get up to 50 push-ups? Of course! How do you go from 5 to 50? It's a miracle! How do you get a miracle going? Number one, do what you can. Don't leave out what you can from writing a letter to your mother in Florida. 
Start cleaning it all up. Two, doing the push-ups. Go from five to 50. It's a miracle. Number one, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Here's number three, rest very little. <laughs> Don't rest too long. Why? The weeds take the garden. Kids have got that figured out. You can't rest too long. Here's the clue. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to act. Think of more disciplines. Think of more ways and means in which to use your own wisdom and your own philosophy and use your own attitude, your own faith, your own courage, your own commitment, your own desires, your own excitement. Invest it, invest it, invest it, invest it in discipline so that it's not wasted. The smallest of discipline. Thereby transform your life. Join the 5%, join the 10%, join the 3%. Guess when I went and got this little book, Richest Man in Babylon? The same day I heard about it, I went and got it. Somebody says, well, Mr. Owen, does that make you different than most other people? And the answer is yes. Somebody says, well, why is that? We don't know. We don't know. What do you know? You don't know. I don't know. None of us knows. Some do and some don't. The numbers don't change. Only the faces change. From those who get in on a seminar like this, listen to a dynamic sermon, read a book, listen to some cassettes, take seriously the next conversation of a friend who wants to level with you and do something about it. And you can walk away from the 97% and not live there anymore. Because if you don't, the next six years of your life will be like the last six. Mr. Shove said to me, Mr. Rohn, six years now you've been working, I'm telling you the next six years of your life is going to be like the last six unless you take advantage and start making these personal changes. I made the changes, totally revolutionized my life. So take a look at the next five years of your life. It's going to be like the last five unless, 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 unless you change. And if you will change, everything will change. Join the 5%. Ten years from now, the numbers are going to be the same. But I'm telling you, some faces in this audience can change and start showing up in the 3% crowd, in the 5% crowd, in the 10% crowd, and thereby dynamically affect your life and your future. I really came close once, about three years ago. She was pretty, tall, trim. We both liked movies, I liked football, and she didn't mind football that much, so that was okay. But I really wanted to be sure we were doing the right thing. You know, marriage is such a big step. It's a lifelong commitment. So we were talking about the future, what her life might be like. And just like that, she said a couple of things that really bothered me. So I wanted to make double sure I was marrying the right girl. So I went home one night and I wrote down all the things that I wanted our relationship to be. I spelled everything out really clearly. I mean, I really thought this thing through. Religion, children, where we'd live, who our friends would be. Because I didn't want there to be any doubts or misunderstandings. I wanted it to be clear. I even mentioned a couple of her bad habits. I thought it'd be a good idea if she had just a little constructive criticism. Well, the next time we got together, I brought this document out. And I thought that we would have a nice, easy conversation about it. And you couldn't believe her reaction. She blew up. I couldn't believe it. She told me straight where to go, and she called our engagement off right then and there. She actually said, I don't need a boss, George, so just forget it. And you know, in thinking back, maybe I did go a little overboard, but it just seems to me that making that big a decision, you can't be too careful, right? Wrong, George. Absolutely wrong. You can be too careful. In fact, you were too careful. The test of a successful person is not the ability to eliminate all problems before they arise, but rather to meet and work out difficulties when they do arise. We must be willing to make an intelligent compromise with perfection, or else we will wait forever, because conditions will never be right. Cross bridges when you come to them, not before. About two years ago, my wife and I lived in an apartment, one of those places out in the suburbs. It wasn't too big, but it was kind of nice. Um, 
but it really cost a mint to rent $750 a month, which was a lot, and we'd been kind of saving up some money to buy a place of our own, knowing that that would take a long time. But what would happen is every time I made out the rent check, I thought, no, there's got to be a better way. This, this is not what I want to be doing. So one day when I was making out the rent check, I said to my wife, I said, um, uh, Susan, let's go buy a place of our own. And she looked at me and she said, well, yeah, we, we can't do that. We've only got $6,000 in the bank. We need at least twice mu that much to make a down payment. And I said, well, now nah, there's got to be a way to do this. I mean, people buy houses all the time. And why don't we just go for it and see if we can make it happen? So she said, okay, let's, let's give it a try. And um, we started to look for places. We looked for about a week or so and came up with a nice place that we needed $15,000 to make a down payment for, which meant we needed to come up with another $9,000. It turned out we couldn't borrow the money from a bank. We went around to all of, all of our banks. And we are kind of stuck for a bit, but then, see, it was a new house. And I thought I could go to the builder and maybe he could loan it to me. And I did. And he, he went with the idea. And that meant we only had to come up with another $450 a month to pay back this loan, because we're going to pay it back over a two-year period. And we sat down, redid our budget, and squeezed another $200 out of it. So we needed to find another $250. And then, then Susan had an idea. She said, well, wait a minute, I can maybe go talk to my boss, because he's advertising for another part-time person. And she did. She explained the situation. We needed another $250, and she knew he couldn't afford to give her a raise. But if she could do this other job, he would get a good employee, we could get the money, and everybody would be happy. Well, the guy was so surprised, he said, yeah, let's do it, let's go for it. So we did it. Everybody was happy. We're paying the house off now. We're living in a nice place. And uh, I guess where there's a will, there is a way. Jim and Susan get A's for action on this one. They didn't let obstacles stand in their way. And they didn't wait for things to be just right before they acted. They decided they wanted something, and they went for it. The resolution to take action ignited their minds to think of ways to accomplish their goals. On top of that, they both gained tremendously in new confidence. It'll be much easier for both of them to take Take action in future situations. Both of these examples point up the benefits of action. You give your ideas value by acting on them. Again, regardless of how good an idea is, it is useless until you act on it. A good idea not acted upon brings tremendous psychological pain, but a good idea acted upon brings enormous mental satisfaction and peace of mind.
There are moments that try the human soul so violently and so perplexing that if the truth were told, all of us have had moments that we wanted to throw up our hands and walk away. Discouragement can creep in secretly, hide behind clothes, makeup, hairdos. Discouragement is so bold that it will even hide behind a smile. It will always ride to work with you. And if it doesn't catch a ride going to work, it'll catch a ride on the way back home. Discouragement will go into a tent. It will walk right into a Section 8 neighborhood. But don't think that it stops. Discouragement will walk right into a middle-class house. It won't just stop there. It'll go in a mansion and sit on the side of a jacuzzi and tell you life is not worth living. If you listen at discouragement, it will cause you to make bad decisions. It will cause you to think that life is not worth living. And secretly behind the facade of a smile and a good morning and a praise Lord and a how are you, you will wonder if you're ever going to get out of what you're into. One of the things that we know about life is that it is always changing. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes you're happy, and sometimes you're sad. Now that's that thing called life. And when we begin to understand and know that, accepting that reality, that we will never ever have things just on an even kill all the time, that you're gonna have some ups and you're gonna have some downs, but during those down moments, that's where the growth takes place. That's where the work is. Anybody can feel good when they have their health, their bills are paid, they have happy relationships, the children are acting normal, business is successful. Anybody could be positive then. Anybody can have faith under those kinds of circumstances. See, but the real challenge, the real challenge of growth, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, comes when you get knocked down. Adversity introduces a man to himself or a woman. How you handle it, that's where the growth takes place. And you can run faster with a hundred who want to go than with one around your neck. These people are bad for your health. Toxic relationships are relationships with people that always criticize you. All they can do is find fault. All they can do is just exploit your weaknesses. All they can do is remind you of the mistakes that you've made in the past. How do you think? And how do you get to think the way you think? And what made you think what you think right now? The, the, the history that, that, that created you is still with you. And even though you wear different clothes, drive a different car, it's the same person. Because somehow, our history is so heavy, it's tough to cut loose. We still apologize for being successful. We feel ashamed to be in charge. See, there are some people that aren't good for you. So you got to look at the people in your life and find out what kind of person are you becoming because of that relationship. My mother used to say, birds of a feather flock together. You run around with losers, you will end up a loser. Now listen to me, I don't care if you're sick, I don't care what you're going through. If you're not dead, he ain't through with you yet. As long as you're waking up, you're still in the game. You can still make it happen. As long as that breath in your nostrils boot, you're still in the game. You still can win. Now get your butt up. This is time to look at the relationships in your life and ask the question, what kind of person am I becoming because of this relationship? Am I growing mentally and emotionally and spiritually? Am I becoming a better person because of this relationship? Is it an asset to me or a liability? Don't save that last bullet for yourself. You lock and load that last bullet and you shoot it at your enemy and you keep fighting and you keep fighting no matter what 
And if you feel like your life is in a place where you can't get any lower, good. Because that means the ultimate challenge is ahead of you. It means you can only go up. See, but will cause you to procrastinate, but will cause you to hide out behind fear, but will cause you to come up with all type of excuses that you can validate your inaction. And right now, more than ever, people need to look for ways to live their dream. People need, need to look for ways to make it on their own. There is no such thing as job security. There's no such thing as a storm-proof or tragic-proof life. Discipline is defined as self-imposed standards for the sake of a higher goal. All leaders have to have the quality of self-discipline. You are not a leader if you are not self-disciplined. A leader doesn't need much discipline from the outside. They self-impose discipline on themselves. And that is what we call self-discipline. Because what I want you to know, what I want to know, what I want you to know, is that everything worthwhile is up here. Everything. There is nothing in your life, there is nothing in my life that's worthwhile, that's quick and easy. You have to fight for it every day. You have to climb for it every day. It doesn't come to you. It's not in three easy packages and it's not the cure to overnight success. Everything worthwhile is uphill. For anybody out there who's chasing greatness, who's trying to make a change in their life, who knows that there is something better out there for them, I'm talking to you. Because on your journey to whatever you want, right to that ever elusive best version of yourself there's going to be times in your journey where you catch yourself comparing your path to others and that's the problem there are those of you you're still immature when your excitement is up your effort is up but when your excitement goes down your effort goes down for some of you you're too seasonal when you're excited Man, you coming to work the first week, the first month, the first three months when you got that job, you were excited, and so you were putting forth effort. You were blazing. Not you got comfortable, and you're not excited no more. And guess what happened? Your effort has gone down. So do me a favor. Get off of that feeling stuff. Get off your excitement. We're not dealing with feelings because feelings go up and down. You don't have to be excited. You made a commitment to that job. Didn't nobody force you to take that job. You signed your name on the dotted line. And commitment said, I don't care how I feel. I don't care if I'm excited. I don't care if I'm pumped up. I don't care if I'm fired up. You made a commitment. Now it's time to put up. The promise of the future is an awesome force. We look back for experience, but we have to look forward now for inspiration. And what gives us inspiration to get up in the morning and do our job, learn skills, develop all that we can possibly be, is the promise of the future. And it can be so powerful that it can overwhelm any adversary you might have, any difficulties you might have. Here's a key phrase, reasons make the difference in how your life works out. Reasons make the difference in your appetite and zest for taking on the challenge, doing the job, becoming successful. Mr. Shoff said, if you have enough reasons, you can do the most incredible things. You can get through the most difficult day. You can overcome the most unbelievable challenges if you have enough reasons. And so he said to me, if you haven't got a list of your goals, Mr. Rohn, it's probably because you don't have enough reasons. He said, I'm sure since I've met you, you have enough intelligence. And he said, you have enough good health. And he said, you have, you know, all of those things working for you. But here's what you must work on now is to have enough reasons. Looking into the future, developing reasons. Okay. Now here's a note to make. It's important to make sure that the greatest pull on your life is the pull of the future. 
Some people let the past pull them back, pull them back. The past can be like gravity if you let it to pull you back. Some people live in the past. They live in the darkness of the past. They live in the mistakes of the past. They live in the discouragement of the past. They didn't make it, you know, and that affects them for the rest of their life living in the past. So we don't want the past to pull us back to live in the past. So make this note. Dreams and goals can become magnets. Dreams and goals can become magnets. And the stronger the goal, the higher the purpose, the more powerful the objective, the stronger this magnet is that pulls you that direction. You are everything. Keep trucking and keep doing the things that you need to do. There's greatness in you. Say it as many times as you have to. It can even start as a whisper. There's greatness in you. But keep repeating it because the mindset works best with consistency, even when it hurts, even when it's hard. Keep moving forward, keep believing in yourself. Every multi-millionaire and every multi-billionaire in this world that are living on the top have all decided that I'm gonna commit myself to this career, this vision, this goal. No parties, they're gonna call you names, they're gonna say you're corny, they're gonna call you a square. Those are the characteristics of a champion. Those are the characteristics of someone that have said that I have decided that I'm gonna create a shift in this universe. When I'm discouraged, I need somebody to come alongside me to encourage me that weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning that kind of talk wakes up my faith most of us go through life pretending pretending that everything is okay pretending that that we don't have any special goals or ambitions or desires pretending that we're satisfied where we are but if you look at our behavior if you judge based upon what we do see a lot of people pretend that they want more out of life but all you have to do is watch their actions that will tell you something. Some of y'all playing. Stop playing. You talk about you want to be successful. Stop tripping. You ain't serious. If you say it's too much, if you say you can't do no more, it means you don't want it. You're not willing to make the investment. It ain't never too much if you really want it. It's not the most talented person that succeeds. Talent don't mean a doggone thing if talents don't show up. It's not the quickest. It's not the fastest. It's not the strongest. No, 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 no. That's not the person who makes all their dreams become a reality. Sometimes it's less talent and more effort. So here's what we want to do in our goal setting session is to start looking into the future of what you would like to accomplish, and where you would like to go, the person you would like to be, and see if you can't get a better picture of the finished objective. See yourself there, see yourself in possession of. For your dreams to greatly influence you, for the future to pull you, your future must be well planned. There are two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension, the other with anticipation. Guess how many people face the future with apprehension? Why? They don't have it well designed. And without really thinking about it, they have probably bought someone else's view of how to live. You will face the future with anticipation when you have planned a future you can get excited about. When you have designed your future results in advance. In this way, the future will capture your imagination it will exert an enormous influence on you. And to design your future, you must have goals. Well-defined goals are like a magnet. They pull you in their direction. And the better you have defined them, the better you have described them, the harder you work on them, the stronger they pull. And they pull you through all kinds of difficulties too. Without goals, it is easy to let life deteriorate to the point where you're just making a living. It is not difficult to get trapped by economic necessity, 
and settle for existence rather than substance. We all have a choice. We can either make a living or design a life. Now we're going to take some time to actually start designing the next 10 years of your life. We're going to start setting your goals. Goal setting is one of the most important skills to develop if you want to design your future. I'm going to give you enough homework not only to keep you busy for the rest of your life, but also to help you create the kind of life you may have always dreamed about living, but never believed possible. So let's get on with it. The sooner you exert the discipline, the sooner you will be enjoying the results. Once the results start to come, believe me, you won't mind the hard work and discipline it's going to take. Now, get a sheet of paper, and at the top of it, write the words, long-range goals. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to jot down the answers. If you don't have paper and pen handy, follow along with me now anyway, just listening. Then later, listen again when you can write down your ideas. After I've asked the questions, which is the first part of this exercise, you can stop the tape and work on your answers. Entitle this part of it now, Workshop. And under the workshop, I'm gonna ask a series of questions and it's gonna serve as a model so that you can teach this to your children, you can teach it in classes, you can teach it anywhere. Under the workshop, now here's the first question. What five things have you already accomplished that you're proud of? Let's take some credit before we go to work on the future. We've accomplished some things in the past. Let's give ourselves credit for that. What five things have you already accomplished that you're proud of? So I want you to make a note of that question and then I want you to do the exercise. Make a list of five things that you can think of that you've already accomplished that you're proud of. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to support our work. You can also support us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell button to get notified when our new videos are released. And as always, thank you for watching.